Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Total Biscuit. So this video was sparked off by a recent incident that you're either going to hear about or have already heard about from a channel by the name of Nerdcubed, one of the folks that hangs around in our sort of circle of YouTubers. He's been on the podcast a number of times, he's been on the Co-optional Lounge a few times, the Secret Hitler streams, all sorts of things like that. Very successful YouTube channel, does a lot of Let's Play stuff, also does a lot of sort of one-shot, I'm gonna try this game and do a kind of edited Let's Play sort of thing. Not as much focused on critique as a channel like this would be, but certainly has no qualms whatsoever about expressing his feelings when he plays a game that he does not like. And that formula seems to work very well for him. Now, what happened recently is that a company by the name of Odd Games decided to send him an email. And this was in regards to a video he made about a year ago on a game called Monster Truck Destruction. I think you can sort of see where this is going. The game wasn't very good and he let people know that and then of course moved on. A year later, in comes an email from Odd Games, this Australian developer, saying the following. Thank you for taking the time to conduct a review on Monster Truck Destruction, which highlighted several flaws with the game. Please note that we as the developer have now corrected these issues and ask you to remove this video as it is now citing incorrect facts which can be interpreted as defamatory. If the video is not removed within 48 hours, we will escalate to the relevant authorities. Now, when Dan told me about this, I told him to make sure that it had actually come from them, that it wasn't sort of a spoofed email trying to cause trouble. He emailed them back and said, just confirming this email was actually sent from this address and is legitimate. And I said, yep, we can confirm this email is legitimate. Okay, Odd Games, you are idiots. <laughs> Unbelievable idiots. You're not the first developer to try and pull this kind of nonsense. You will not be the last, but it has never, ever, ever ended well for any developer that has tried to interfere in some way in the critical process. It has never worked out well for any developer that has tried to censor opinion, which is exactly what this is. And it's never worked out well when you accompany that with a threat. I would love to know what relevant authorities they intend to escalate a defamation claim to, bearing in mind that a defamation claim would be a civil matter and does not go to the police. I'm not sure they fully understand what defamation is. Fortunately, I do, mostly. I have a degree in law, and we studied defamation under our taught education, which went on for about a year. So I know the ins and outs of defamation, that being libel and slander, and... While the laws do have a tendency to change on a country-by-country -country basis, I can say with reasonable certainty that there is no such thing as retroactive defamation. The idea that something that you said was true then, but is no longer true, ergo you can be sued for defamation for something that you said in the past, basically being punished for not being a time traveler. This is becoming something of a bigger issue as of late because of the nature of the internet. The idea that you might have the right to be forgotten is something that EU courts are currently looking into. However, as it stands, if you publish the fact and it was true at the time, you are under no obligation to remove or retract said fact later down the line. Now, I'm discussing things that actually matter here, such as false crime allegations and all sorts of things like that. I'm not talking about my video game got a bad review a year ago and now we've kind of fixed it, we think, so you have to delete all of your coverage of it back then. No, no, you do not. The notion is unbelievably ludicrous. Think about how absolutely impossible it would be to run a game review site if you had to go back with every single update and change things in the review because they may have updated or patched the game to fix some of them. Imagine how impossible it would be to keep up. It's already impossible to keep up with just one video or one written article considering the sheer number of games that are released on a daily basis. It would be absurd to suggest that reviewers or even anyone that expressed an opinion about the game should have to update their opinion especially on a game so insignificant. And what boggles my mind about this is not just how detached from reality it is, it's how egotistical, it's how arrogant it is. This game sucks. This is not an important game of any description. It's a trashy little piece of shovelware. And yet they expect somebody to remove the content that they did on it a year ago because they claim to have fixed the problems. Are you out of your mind? The very notion that somebody would update their coverage in such a way. And you know, there's nothing wrong with necessarily asking a YouTuber or a game reviewer on a website to update 
what they have to say. You can, you can ask, sure. You're not guaranteed anything. And the reviewer or critic in question is under no obligation at all to update their opinion. But if you ask nicely, they might. Sure. If you ask nicely. Not if you threaten them with legal action. This is not defamation. Because he didn't lie in the first place. I mean, obviously, this situation is utterly ridiculous. And there's no way in hell that the developer is in the right. I think everybody can see that. But the reason I wanted to talk about this was, one, to give a bit of support to one of our colleagues. And secondly, to use it as a little springboard for a wider discussion on the rather unique nature of video games. And the ever-changing form of media that we find ourselves in. It may very well be that critique of video games is one of the most difficult forms of critique in the modern world. That sounds outlandish when it comes out of my mouth, but think about that for a second. I'm not saying, oh, reviewing video games is so hard. No, 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 no. What I'm saying is that if you were to compare it to other forms of media, such as movies, books, or even things that are not forms of media, maybe a meal or a restaurant, you'll find that there is one key difference between all of those things and video games. The key difference is that video games are in a constant state of change. When a product is released, that product may not represent the form of that product that could exist a year down the line. It used to be that the only video games that would change in such drastic ways were MMOs because they were constantly updated. But now every game is constantly updated. Everything has digital patch delivery, which means that at any time, a game could fundamentally change from its launch version. Now that doesn't really happen all that often with movies unless you're dealing with something by George Lucas who likes to go back and consistently screw with his previous work. You might get a director's cut or an extended edition of a movie, but it is fairly unlikely that you're going to have any more than maybe one major change. So let's say you wanted to review a movie, you may at some point in the future review the director's cut of said movie. You might. But you're not going to be constantly going back and wondering if a scene has changed or they have corrected a camera angle or whatever. That's simply something that you can't do. Books are the same thing. Once they're on paper, that's it. The absolute biggest change you could ever expect is a re-release of some description or maybe, in some very rare instances, a spelling correction in a digital version, an ebook. When it comes to eating a meal, that meal's not going to change. You ate it and it's gone. That's it. You consumed it and you have to review that meal. You have to critique that food in the state that it was when you ate it. It doesn't matter if they make the dish better the next night. So that's irrelevant. And yet with video games, the state of the product is ever changing and the time at which you download said product can fundamentally affect your experience with it. Something that I downloaded six months ago may very well be a hell of a lot better when you download it today. And are either of us wrong when we express our feelings positive or negative on that? Well, no, we're not. Of course not. A game very well might be better later down the line. It more often than not is. Sometimes it's not. You know, I can think of one of the biggest examples of a change to a game that got a lot of people riled up was probably the new game experience with the MMO Star Wars Galaxies. They fundamentally changed large aspects of the game, pissing off a lot of people that were enjoying the game in its current form in an effort to attract new customers to the title. What a nightmare that is. I mean, it's already difficult enough to keep up with MMO coverage, but basically by doing that, they made every review of the game before that completely obsolete. So the question becomes, should reviewers and critics take that into account? To what level should they take that into account? And also, how exactly are consumers supposed to get accurate information when a game is in a constant state of change? Well, that's a bloody good question, and frankly, I don't have a good answer to it. I can tell you as somebody that basically runs the channel solo with a little bit of help from staff, who is the sole person providing opinions on this channel, it would be absolutely impossible for me to keep up with games if I was looking into the state of a game later down the line after I critiqued it. I can't revisit games in the vast majority of circumstances. I mean, one, I don't really want to. And secondly, if I revisit a title, that's time that could be spent looking at a new one. There are so, so many games to look at. On a stream recently, I showed people my review list. And I say review list not because I do reviews, but because industry-wide they're called review copies. And I have over 600 titles 
that came in over the past 12 months that I have yet to cover and will most likely never cover. I only get to cover a fraction of the games that come my way. It's not even possible if you're part of a large organization like IGN. You can't keep people up to date on the changes. It's just not possible. You can't go and re-review a title if something major ends up being changed in it. You certainly can't go and do it if something minor has been changed in it. That's just never going to happen. Now, to some degree, this is a good thing because I feel it does hold developers and publishers to account. It's certainly felt over the past few years that launch titles have become more and more unreliable. They've become more and more incomplete compared to previous games. They are laden with more and more problems and bugs, missing modes. And indeed, there are quite a few games that as a result of that missing content end up never building a strong player base. They end up dying off very, very quickly. Now, I've spoken before as to the willingness some people seem to have when writing a title off before it's time. I have mentioned that it's very possible for games to come around and fix all of their problems and become a truly great experience past their launch date. And that is very, very true. However, the question is, how do you get that information out of there and more to the point, should a developer be punished, I suppose, for releasing a game in an incomplete state? Well, poor reviews on launch are their effective punishment. Negative feedback on launch is their punishment. If you launch a game and it doesn't work very well on launch, it will get lambasted. It will get poor reviews that stick around for a good long time. There are a couple of different websites that have tried altering their scores based on the changing situation that that game is involved in, but I believe they've all abandoned that after they realized how ridiculous it would be to try and keep up to date on all of these titles. It's ludicrously impractical, it's beyond the realms of possibility. And frankly, if you're going to sell a game for full price at the most expensive it's ever been, it's going to be at launch, and the weird thing about that high price is that you're buying what will most likely be the worst version of the game. It's such a strange idea, isn't it? The idea of early adoption. The idea that you pay the most, and yet you get the least. You get the worst experience. If you bought that game or that product sometime down the line, you probably not only have it cheaper, but you would get a better product, a product with less problems. It seems so backwards when you sit down and think about it. If you sit down and think about it, really, nobody should be buying games on launch. And yet, if they didn't, those games would be dead on arrival. It's so strange when you sit down and think about it. This industry and many others, especially when it comes to the technology sector, are driven by this idea of early adoption. And yet, early adopters always get the worst product. And yet, especially in an age of multiplayer games, you can't avoid having early adopters. They're essential. You need that explosion of a player base at the start. You need a bunch of people playing in order to make that game viable and keep it alive. It's not only that, though. You're competing for a very, very small slice of the pie at a time when more developers and more publishers than ever are trying to take a slice for themselves. There are only so many video games that your average consumer can buy, and there are only so many video games that your average consumer can play on a daily basis. If you want to punch your way into the market and make your product relevant for any length of time, you have to have a strong launch in order to do that. There are very few examples of games that have become popular weeks or months after their launch. There are some, but they are the exception rather than the rule. Like it or not, launch is the most important part of a product's life cycle. As long as that continues to be the case, launch reviews will define that product forever. It is very, very rare indeed to see a product recover from a consensus that it is poor upon launch. Now you might be thinking, well, that can't be true because there are plenty of games and movies and books that have been considered cult classics despite being panned by the critics at the time. Yeah, that's true, but when it comes to games, they are a very unique format in the sense that technical issues and problems with the software can be a much bigger issue than, say, the storyline or the casting or many of the other things that define whether or not a movie or another static piece of media is good. 
I find it quite difficult to compare movies to games. A lot of people try and I think it's such a silly idea simply because they are so fundamentally different in so many different ways. But the best comparison I could probably make is you don't see a Hollywood movie where the camera is constantly being knocked over or shut down or is pointed at the wrong thing. Doesn't happen. And yet games have that kind of thing happen all the time. Games have bugs that impede your ability to play them. Games crash. Games have cutscenes that don't work. Games have mechanics that don't operate the way they're supposed to. Games have performance problems. A movie generally doesn't need to be fixed, George. Quit screwing with it. A game more often than not does. Even the most well-reviewed games, even the games that are critical successes are in a constant state of being patched. You know, Overwatch received universal acclaim and now is in a situation where their new mode is being widely panned for not only a questionable competitive structure, but also various bugs which prevent certain players from gaining the ranks that they deserve. That wasn't even present on launch and now it is probably the single most hot topic when it comes to that game. No review is ever going to mention it because the reviews already happened. People have already moved on and the sites and the channels that continue to track these current issues are generally specialists that are actually focused on that game and almost that game alone. Now, a great example of this would be one of our colleagues, Force Strategy Gaming, and I know he hates me calling that, which is why I'm going to call him Force Strategy Gaming. And he has switched his channel to almost purely Overwatch coverage. Eh? Pretty much mono gaming at the moment, as I like to call it. And he's gained a lot of success in doing so. And that's the sort of place that you will go to find up-to-date information on Overwatch. Which is why you have very recent videos about Zenyatta's balance, about the leaving issue in casual play, as well as, of course, the problems that Ranked Mode has. You won't find those in a more traditional media outlet. And it seems to me that the rise of the specialist channel and the specialist website is a necessity as a result of the ever-evolving nature of certain titles over the course of their lifespan. I think this is a fundamental shift in the way that games media operates. There used to be a time when a website like IGN or GameSpot could really be your one-stop shop for everything. Gaming news, games reviews, you pretty much get all the information you needed from one place. Now, maybe this is just a shift in the way the internet has operated. We've shifted very much towards aggregators, the idea that we go to places that will aggregate news and such from various sources, you know, Reddit being a prime example of that, and instead of going to a news site, we'll go to an aggregator. We can customize that aggregator to very much get the information that, that we're interested in, something very specific, something very specialist. We'll no longer go to a single source. We have to go out of our way to find that information elsewhere. And that is definitely a change in consumer behavior, I think. And it's probably one that's for the better. It exposes people to a wider variety of opinions and hopefully gets them to think a little bit more critically and open their mind to other points of view. You know, I don't really like the term social media, but if there was ever a term it would accurately describe, I think the way that post-launch games coverage has evolved would fit pretty well. Word of mouth has become an extremely important facet of game discussion and a really useful tool in the toolbox of the consumer, especially when purchasing a game post-launch. Steam recently recognized that fact by adding a new counter for recent reviews, which goes alongside the total number of reviews and ratings. Now, what we notice with this is that you can have a big disparity between the overall rating, which could be very positive, and the recent rating, which could very well be mixed or negative. And this can, in certain circumstances, provide very useful information to the consumer. It's unfortunately also extremely open to abuse, simply because it takes very little to, I suppose, set off the hardcore fans of an existing title that's been around for a while, particularly when that player base has inevitably shrunk over the course of time. There can certainly be instances where a change in a game may have a mixed reaction, and that can be blown up into a huge amount of negativity from those that didn't want that change to be there in the first place. There can be a huge overreaction to that. There was a time when Darkest Dungeon had this very same issue, 
as a result of the implementation of the heart attack and corpse mechanics. Some people didn't like it, some people did. I mean, if you actually go to the Darkest Dungeon Steam page right now, the majority of reviews on the front page are actually negative. Now, this is of a game that received, again, very positive acclaim on launch, a game that I looked at twice, and both times I was very positive about it for a variety of reasons. But now that the player base has shrunk and hype around the game has died down, you will notice that there do seem to be quite a lot of bitter people that show up. I mean, the most helpful review in the last 30 days has 172 hours on record and then complains about the RNG. Now, with the thought that the random nature of the game would become fairly obvious within the first few hours. However, it took 172, apparently, for this fellow to realize that he didn't like it anymore. And one has to wonder, well, how much of that time period was spent enjoying the game and how much was not. 172 hours for a $25 game is pretty good value for money in my eyes. And yet what you can find with this post-launch coverage is a, a great degree of bitterness, uh, something of an uh, element of buyer's remorse that can be difficult to distinguish from genuine criticism. The thing about launch coverage for a game is that it's more often than not done in something of a vacuum. Reviewers may certainly discuss with each other various aspects of the game, specifically if they happen to be stuck in a particular section. And yet, for the most part, their opinions exist without any sort of context. There is no player base for the game yet. There is no community for the game yet. There are no trends within said community. There is no group think because that community does not exist. And yet, once a game launches... This sort of thing can become very influential in the opinion of anybody that creates a review post-launch. Trends can happen within a community. A sort of hive mind, as it were, can form. And problems can be blown out of proportion. This can cause people to criticize the game unnecessarily harshly. On the flip side, a new feature may very well excite players for a brief degree of time, resulting in rave reviews, only for that feature to later turn out to be not quite as good. You know, a great example of that being the competitive play option for Overwatch, initially received with great praise and then rapidly turning into the biggest problem that the game currently has. While this word-of-mouth and community-driven post-launch coverage setup seems to be the most practical way to ensure that you have accurate information about a product post-launch and post-major changes, it can still run into some very real problems because the people that are doing the reviewing, as it were, are not professional reviewers. Now, I'm not saying that you need to be qualified to review a video game, you absolutely do not, but if it's not your job and you're perhaps more driven by your own personal feelings, anecdotal experiences, as well as your emotional state at the time that you write it, the coverage can end up being far more biased and far less, I suppose, inclusive of a wider audience. It's almost like a lot of people write reviews on Steam for themselves and for themselves alone, and yet it's published to a wide audience and actually can be influential on whether or not somebody decides to pick up a title. That's not to mention, of course, the acts of review bombing and protest reviewing, which I fundamentally disagree with because there is an undercurrent of dishonesty whenever people do that. Whenever I see somebody rate a game as zero on Metacritic or anything along those lines, I have to ask, well, why exactly are you doing this? It seems like you're just going out of your way to lie in order to hurt the developer or publisher for some sort of perceived slight. And that's not useful consumer critique. That's just being vindictive. And yet, of course... That's displayed as part of this overall community coverage. I may very well be putting far too much stock in what is essentially a review for a video game, especially further down the line when those video games are much, much cheaper and far less of a financial risk to purchase. But ultimately, this is the industry that I find myself in, and it is a subject that I'm quite passionate about. I don't really see an easy solution to the continued coverage of such titles that actually provides for a relatively unbiased form of critique. Even when dealing with specialist channels, you're going to find an inherent level of bias there as well, especially if they happen to be making money from said coverage. A channel that is dedicated to a particular game is invested in seeing that game continue to be popular because that's what keeps their videos popular. If you don't care about a game, then you're not going to get all that many views on your videos. So you find that a lot of channels that are committed to a particular series or franchise tend to be erring on the side of positivity. A common thing that I see on the internet is, well, 
why would I listen to a professional reviewer or critic or whatever when I can listen to someone that has 600 hours in the game and is very experienced? Well, yes, I mean, they are very experienced and they probably know all the ins and outs of the title, but simultaneously, if they've been playing for 600 hours and committed that much time, then one has to wonder just how objective they can really be. Can they really put themselves in the shoes of other people? Can they really provide information that's aimed at a person that has never played the game before, that is of real interest or use to them? Sometimes they can, and sometimes it's very much not possible. They end up being incredibly biased one way or the other. There is no easy solution to it. If anything, the only thing that you can do as a consumer is to deliberately read widely from a wide variety of different perspectives. It's impossible for one review, one critique, or whatever to cover everything that you may very well need to know. Not only that, but you're not going to get consistent experiences from person to person. Even on a technical level, there are some games on PC that run well for others and don't run well for somebody else. It makes the pursuit of accuracy an almost impossible task. The only thing that you can really do to make sure that you get accurate information is to read as much as possible and then decide based on all of that information where the middle ground lies. If anything though, I certainly do not blame the consumer for reading, say, a launch day review and then writing the game off. As much as I'd encourage people to try going back to games that didn't work very well on launch because you may very well be surprised by how far they've advanced. We live in an age of information overload. There's so much in the gaming medium. There's so much to keep track of. There are so many video games and so many opinions about said video games. Can you really blame somebody for not spending a day doing detailed research on what could very well be a $10 product? No, no, you really can't. While some of this problem was certainly unavoidable with the nature of the evolution of games these days and the ability to constantly update them with new content and gradually realize a grander vision for the game, some of it absolutely can be avoided by creating a game that works on launch, by not rushing it out, by making sure that it has the feature set that you think people are going to need, that it isn't riddled with bugs and technical problems upon launch. Is that too much to ask? Well, games are certainly more complicated these days, but do you think the consumer cares? They expect a working product on release. I don't think that's particularly unreasonable whatsoever. If games wish to avoid this imaginary situation of retroactive defamation, as odd studios seem to believe is a possibility, then the best way to do that would be to release something that doesn't suck in the first place. My name's been Total Biscuit. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, by all means, do feel free to click the like button. If you did not, the dislike button is right over there. And of course, you can discuss this over on our official subreddit, reddit.com slash r slash cynical brit official. I'll see you next time.